The first way of dealing with Varroa is stopping Varroa before it takes over a colony. You can't say Varroa mite because it's kind of like an oxymoron. So I may be using Varroa or mite, and they'll be the same thing uh, in this conversation. Varroa begins the buildup when there is a bloom of a flower. That's when they're the smallest of smallest. You can't see them. Then they piggyback ride on onto our bees into the hive, and that's when the load begins uh, within the hive there. They get in the hive, and they attach themselves to the thorax of the honeybee, and they go for the ride. And when they attach themselves to the thorax, the honeybee becomes the host for these varroa. With that said, when they become the host, they're also being injected with various viruses. And those viruses will make themselves prevalent in the weeks to come. And then the honeybee will drift from one hive to another. When that honeybee goes to another hive, it's much like our elementary schools and high schools here, is when one child becomes sick and he has a virus, he, he spreads it accidentally to others. And before you know it, there's a lot of kids that are out of school and they're sick. Well, the same thing happens with the honeybees, but this sickness drives like deformed wing virus that incapacitates the honeybee from doing any of its duties. You have this drift factor, and why this is so important is, is that the varroa can take over one hive completely or even just begin, and that drift will spread it through the other colonies that are in your bee yard. You can go from a really great looking bee yard, then three months later, lose them all. We've seen that happen right here on the local level many times over. Numerous emails coming in saying, hey, what did I do wrong? It always comes back to lack of treating for mites. That is so important. What percentage of beekeepers just don't take the time to do that? They may see it as something that is a, a hassle or they don't like the fact that you know, some bees are harmed in, in some of the various ways to check for mites. Any idea based on just uh, your years of experience, people's attitudes towards checking? Well, Brian, this used to be something very foreign, a foreign concept to most beekeepers until they, they lost one or more hives and really wanted to see what was happening. Then the next season, they went ahead and started treating. There's beekeepers that haven't done their homework and have missed the boat. Even commercial beekeepers I've seen uh, say, hey, I didn't treat last year and this is all a farce and it has nothing to do with me and beekeeping. And then the next year they lose four or five, 600 hives and they say, hey, I do have issues and my, my bees are not as hygienic and cleaning themselves as I thought that they did. A lot of folks that sell honeybees, they'll say, hey, my honeybee's better than yours. Well, hmm. the, the issue is, is that they all have the hygienic cleanliness. The issue is, is what are we as beekeepers setting them up for to thrive or, or not thrive and maybe even die off? I would say, Brian, that we're probably seeing about a 30 to 35% of the beekeepers are treating on, a, on an annual basis and maybe half of that doing a double treatment on that side. So we need to get those numbers up, and uh, that's obviously what we're focusing on tonight is equipping you to go on the offensive. I've been kind of beating this drum for about four or five years now uh, as we've seen losses, staggering losses on the local side and also on the nationwide side of the die-offs. So it's just really, really critical that we take time and spend those few extra dollars and save us a lot of time and headaches. Because, you know, if we replace a hive, it's probably gonna be 18 months before we see any kind of return on investment on our bees. How can we go on the offensive? Okay, so this kit, this is what it looks like. It has a top, and then it has this little uh, drum that goes on the inside. What you would do is you would take a frame, and let's just say there's a bunch of bees on there. I would just scoop them up like this, put them in, and you wanna fill this up at least three quarters of the way. That is equal to one cup of bees. Why do we do that? 
The reason is, is that we're getting a census. There's roughly 200 honeybees that will be in this. Now you will want to put your, your hand over this to keep the bees in. And you will want to put all the way up uh, two thirds of the way with rubbing alcohol. Then you'll set this in and then screw this top on. And then you basically just shake it for, for four minutes. And what this does is it dislodges the varroa from the back of the honeybee. That is what you're gonna do your counts on. If you have five or more mites, you got a mite load problem and you need to go on ahead and start your treatments. We use Formic Pro, but one of the holdbacks from using Formic Pro is you cannot treat your bees when it's 90 degrees or, or hotter. So that is a drawback. You'll have to wait to do that. I like to say at least three days that you have under 90 degrees when you do that treatment. And then what you'll do is you'll take that shake bottle and just pour it over a paper towel, a white paper towel, and you'll be able to count your mites at that point in time. That is a fail safe method that will do you well on that side. Hey Ray, how many of the hives should you inspect? So let's just hypothetically say you've got 20 hives how many of those would you check? Or is it just as soon as you hit that threshold of five in one, it means all of them could be in, infected? Well, because of drift and, and things like that there, I highly recommend that you do each, each hive. You don't have to do it all in one setting. You can say, hey, look, I'm gonna do this one on Monday. I'm gonna do these three on Wednesday and do these five on, on Friday. And you could even do it over the weekend. Um, taking a break, do one in the morning and one in the evening when it's a little cooler outside. And by the way, folks, um, we're getting some really good reviews on our cool vests, uh, especially those folks out in the Midwest that are seeing those 100 degree temperatures. Do we have any left in stock? Yes, we have about 100 left in stock. And once they're gone, they're gone till next year on that, Brian. You have a couple of avenues that you can do a treatment for Varroa. I always like to use an organic way of treating my bees. It's always served me very, very well without introducing chemicals to my bees. One other way is using oxalic acid on a, on a vaporizer. And what you see, uh, see to my side here is one that you hook up to a battery and it takes about three to five minutes for the oxalic acid to vaporize and then you've treated your hive. Then I like to let it set in there for about three more minutes and then pull it out, open up the front of the hive so that some ventilation can happen on that. Ray, Charles uh, in the chat says, is there a max temperature for oxalic acid treatments with all these high temperatures we've been talking about mm -hmm. tonight? Does that affect the treatment at all? Okay, with high temperatures means that not all the bees are gonna be inside the hive. Uh, again, if you're, if you're having a lot of bearding going on, you don't want to do it during the day because your foragers are going to be the main culprits of bringing in Varroa and they're not going to show any of a, of a mite load within the hive. You want to do your oxalic acid vapor in the evening or early in the morning before daybreak because they will be out foraging the moment it gets light out. And then we also have Apigard uh, that you could also use and that's something that you can use on temperatures above 90 degrees. As with all treatments, highly watch the instructions so that you don't set your bees back. And of course, what I said earlier is the Formic Pro is, is very suitable also. Now, I want to deal with one fallacy that, that's out there, and that's sugar powder shakes. And that's basically where you take um, confectionery sugar and sprinkle them, uh, uh, sprinkle it over your bees and you see your bees hygienically cleaning each other, and it makes us all feel good because we see that hygienicness going on within the colony. Clemson University did a, a study on this, and basically it doesn't do any good for the bees, and it doesn't do anything for the beekeeper. They saw no, no changes whatsoever on a mite load doing a sugar shake over them on that there as they had stated to me at one point in time, it just makes the beekeeper feel great. And <laughs> so, so don't do that. I, and I know that there's some 
older beekeepers out there that that swear by that, but the the science doesn't lie on it. 